Well, good morning, Grant Memorial Church. It is good to be with you today. Uh, now, I need to be honest. I was tempted to wear a short sleeve shirt and sandals today to signify the rapid move from extreme cold last week to tropical heat this weekend, right? I, I hope that you have a chance to enjoy this weather because who knows what is coming next. Now, regarding what's coming next uh, right now, uh, today we're continuing our series in the Old Testament book of Jonah. So I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Jonah chapter 3. And we pick up our text uh, after Jonah has been vomited onto dry land by a large fish within whom he has been taking up residence for three days. So you can close your eyes and imagine the state of Jonah. You can probably even smell him a little bit as we begin to read what happens next. Jonah chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that today uh, you would help us to learn from it, that we would be challenged by it, and we would be encouraged as we participate in what you have called us to do. Things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. What a story, right? What a turn of events. What an incredible moment in history. A pagan city of at least 120,000 people repenting of their evil ways and God showing mercy and grace to those who certainly do not deserve it based on their track record. Well, why don't we walk through the text verse by verse to help us interpret and digest just what we have read and just what God did for the Assyrian city of Nineveh. And just a quick note, we're going to remain in this text next week as well. So we won't be covering everything today that, you, that may have caught your eye or attention, but we'll start at verse 1 and we'll see how far we get. So uh, verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, if you have been following with us throughout this series, these words should ring a bell for you, right? Because they are almost verbatim what we read in chapter 1, right? In chapter 1, 1 to 2, we read this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. You see the similarities on those two uh, sections of Scripture? Isn't that interesting? It's almost like the entire contents of chapter 1 and 2 are forgotten, and the text simply starts 
over. The, the source is the same. The, the word of the Lord came. The who is the same to the Hebrew prophet Jonah. The where is the same. Go to Nineveh in Assyria. And the task is the same. Preach, proclaim, relay what God has to say to them. Now, think with me for a moment what Jonah must have been thinking. Imagine the surprise, the shock that Jonah must have felt to hear those words again? The, the beautiful deja vu of God speaking to his prophet with a mission for him to accomplish? The, the, the surprise that, that God would trust him again? The amazement of a second chance? The wonder that he hadn't been disqualified from service when he ran away? Not only did, did God give him a second shot at life, God gave him a second chance at service. He, he reinstated him as a prophet. He reinstated Jonah's purpose. And this is such an important lesson for us. As we read this text, we realize that Jonah's God, our God, is a God of second chances. Or as William L. Banks expands on this, we are moved to speak of Jonah's God as the God of the second chance. But honest, sober reflection compels the saint to speak of him as the God of the 999th chance. Right? Such gracious mercy as was extended to Jonah here and to David and to the thief dying upon the cross and to Peter, surely it has been granted to all believers through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So, church, what does this mean for us today? Well, simply, God has not given up on you. And he will never give up on you. Our, our past disobedience does not disqualify us from being used by God. Even our present disobedience does not eliminate us from being commissioned by God again. And this is important for us because I think that many of us struggle with feelings of worth when it comes to serving God. Right? As, as if I need to deserve a calling from God. Right? I, I need to have my life in order first. Or I need to somehow be sinless. Or I need to know the Bible better. Or I need to, I need to, I need to. But here's the thing. Serving God is not about us. God does not call us because we have earned it. Or deserve it. God does not limit his calling to those with degrees or an office in the church building. Or as we read in our text, even to the ones who obey the first time. As we read in Titus 3, 5 to 8. He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done. But because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the living hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. We are saved because of God's mercy, not our worthiness. And we are saved that we may live out the new life given to us in Christ Jesus, doing good and serving his kingdom. Church, God graciously invites all of his children to participate in the mission of bringing the good news of Jesus and the truth of his word to every nation, to every city, to every workplace, to every family. And it's not our resume that determines if he will use us.
but it is simply our obedience when he asks us the first or even the second or 999th time. And that's precisely the difference, the only difference really between the narratives in chapter 1 and chapter 3. As we read in verse 3, Jonah obeys God. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Right? In chapter 1, Jonah got up and fled towards Tarshish. But in chapter 3, Jonah gets up and goes to Nineveh in, in response to God's offer of a do-over or a mulligan. Jonah chooses to take it. Now, before we get too high on Jonah here, let's remember that both pagan sailors and a fish obeyed God before Jonah did. But it's never too late to say yes to God, and our past mistakes do not disqualify us from service to him. So what is God calling you to do? Where are you being invited to serve? And what is the excuse that you have been using not to? For Jonah, it meant traveling into enemy territory to tell them about the, the justice and wrath of God towards evil. And as we will see, he does just that. Picking up in verse 3 and 4. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city and then proclaimed. Now, as we've already discovered, Nineveh was a significant city in terms of size and status. No one sings a song, O Little Town of Nineveh. Right? This was a major city and one known globally simply by name, like New York, Paris, or London. And yes, of course, I mean London, Ontario. Now, if you're a walker or mathematician, you may be wondering about the statement that it took three days to travel through Nineveh. And you would be right to pick that out. Uh, Nineveh's ruins, uh, found today uh, across the river from Mosul, Iraq spans 750 hectares, which is a large area and a massive one by ancient Mesopotamian standards. But it certainly would not take three days to walk to get through it. Uh, for reference, the city of Winnipeg, which is roughly 45,000 hectares, 750, 45,000 hectares, could be walked through, according to Google Maps, in roughly five hours. Now, for those curious about my measurements, my, my calculations begin at the log cabin McDonald's down Pemina at the bottom of your screen and go to where the perimeter intersects North Main Street. Now, as an aside, I think a few of us may need to try that out this summer, right? See if we can make it through the city in five hours, uh, stopping for Slurpees along the way, of course. But it forces us to ask the question, what could this statement possibly mean? It took three days to go through it. Well, some have suggested that one does not simply walk, you know, five hours at a time. And it would take uh, three days to reasonably make it out of the town. Uh, so it was kind of an estimation of measurement. It wasn't a one-day town. It wasn't a two-day town. It was a three-day town for the casual traveler. Others have added to this that, that three days journey begins in the suburbs, right? The Assyrian towns surrounding the city of Nineveh. And if one, you know, walks reasonably 20, 20 miles per day, they would make it through the roughly 60 mile region uh, in three days. Uh, still others suggest that it would, it would, it would have taken uh, Jonah three days to travel to all the different parts of the city, weaving from neighborhood to neighborhood, sharing his message with all the people. Uh, and finally, there are some who've pointed out, uh, pointed to the customs of the day to help understand the meaning of this statement. As one historical commentator points out, Eastern etiquette for ambassadors, diplomats, and, and prophets in cities of significance like Nineveh was as follows. There would be a, a first day, which would be a day of settlement and arrival. 
Then the second day, which was the day of formal presentation to the authorities of the city, stating just why uh, they came into the city in the first place. And then on the third day, there would be, that would be the day for conducting business, doing whatever it is that they had come to do, and, and in fact, maybe the day of departure. Interestingly enough, the original NIV translation, 1984, lands here uh, with its translation stating, Now Nineveh was a very important city, a visit required three days. Right? That's how the NIV originally had translated that. Uh, so all of that to say, right? all of that to say that we don't quite know what was meant by this statement. But, but I share these options, these different interpretations with you to invite you into the mystery of the text, right? We're invited here not to measure, but to picture how great this city is, especially in comparison with the rest of the world at the time, right? We're, we're invited to picture a large, important city bustling with activity, with tradition. Jonah is not speaking to the streets or a small gathering. Jonah is downtown in one of the greatest cities on the planet at the time. And it is here where Jonah shares the word he's received from the Lord. And our text says that he does it on day one. He, he immediately begins to speak, right? In a three-day town, he speaks on the first day, and that is the part that's significant. He doesn't wait until the perfect time or until he's planted some seeds first. If what we speculated about customs is true, that business waited until the third day, well, he skipped those customs altogether and jumped right into his business, he didn't stall, he didn't wait, he didn't delay, he didn't wait for permission. As verse 4 says, on day 1, he proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Which, if you think about it, isn't a really a great message, right? It's not a really great message, not a fun message to preach, not extremely articulate. I guess it gets to the point. And unfortunately, our text doesn't tell us if he said more than this, right? We don't know if Jonah explained why they would be overthrown or if he warned them to listen because when he himself disobeyed, he found himself with a whale of a problem. My apologies. Um, we just don't know how the conversations went, Right? If there were conversations. But the thing that we are sure about is that whatever he said, he was speaking the word of the Lord. Right? If we go back to verse 1, we see that Jonah was to speak simply the words God gives him. Right? 3 verse 1, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message, I give you And what's so important about this, right? What's so important about this, as, as preacher Alistair Begg puts it, Jonah was not at liberty to go into the city of Nineveh and simply say what he wanted to say, right? Nor was he at liberty to go into the city of Nineveh and tell them what they wanted to hear. But rather, he was to go into the city and declare what God desired for them to know, right? And that is where we must pause and receive this challenge. And it's also where I, the one on this platform today, need to consider greatly. You see, in increasingly, uh, pulpits in North America have become platforms for teachers to say what they want to say. To put forth philosophies, ideas, explanations, ideologies to the people they've been entrusted with teaching. And often these teachers trickle scripture into their messages. But make no mistake, they're their messages, their agendas, their own words and not necessarily the words of the Lord. And I want to tell you that I take these warnings very seriously. 
And I know that I'm not immune from this temptation to use this platform for something other than for which it was granted. Which is why my default, and in fact, the default at grant, which I love, is to use the scriptures as our primary source of information, as our main source for all study and teaching. And, and while I don't, I don't take it off the table in the future, we typically do not preach topical sermon series, but we study in depth the word of the Lord that's been entrusted to us book by book and verse by verse, right? I don't think that I've been entrusted with sharing my preferential parenting tactics and then connecting them to scripture. I don't think that I've been entrusted today with discussing whatever happens to be on my heart or my mind and then finding a biblical passage to back up my views or feelings. Now, now again, I'm not saying that we never preach through topics or explore themes in a biblical way. It's important that we do so. But we always want to be a church that lets the word of God speak exponentially louder than the instrument he happens to be using on any given Sunday. And so for those who think it's crazy to spend 10 weeks in Jonah or 14 weeks in 1 John, the, the reason we do it is because we believe the word of the Lord has come to us in the scriptures and it's his word that we have been called to share, not our own. As Sinclair B. Ferguson reminds us, our God-given task is simply and directly to teach God's word and truth to our contemporaries. God may use us, our experience and our testimony as he pleases, but we have a responsibility to make his truth as clear as we are able. Author Jacques uh, Ellul echoes this when he says, the greatest saint or mystic can say nothing of value unless it is based solely on God's word. Right? And that is what we endeavor to do here at Grant. And that is what I hope you endeavor to do when you serve because this, this idea, this concept applies not just to pastors and preachers. This applies to Sunday school teachers, to small group leaders, youth leaders, elders, deacons, parents, friends, maybe even those with social media accounts. May we, all of us, be a people who, like Jonah in this instance, proclaim the message God has given us through his word. Our service to Christ, whatever that may look like, is not a platform for our own ideas and thoughts, but it's a platform to speak God's ideas and thoughts and to point to people to what God has to say. And when we do that, when we step out of the way and let God's word speak through us, amazing things happen. Listen to the result of people hearing the word of the Lord. Verse 5 and 6. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God. A, a fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Church, when God's word is spoken, things happen, right? People come to believe in him. As God says about his word in Isaiah 55, 10, he says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God, God's word is life-changing. And it will accomplish whatever God wants it to accomplish. And we can be confident of this when we speak it, when we teach it, and when we point people to it. 
Now, we would be missing something, I think, if we didn't ask the question of the Ninevite response, what just happened? Right? What, what just happened? Didn't we spend significant time in this study already talking about the wickedness, the, the treachery of these people? Aren't these the ones who were known around the world for being ruthless? And Jonah simply mutters a warning and immediately this entire nation believes God? And they begin the process of repentance for the very evil that defined them and that they took pride in? Is it that easy? Well, the simple answer is not quite. I mean, it is that easy for Jonah. But what Jonah did is not the entirety of the story. You see, God had already been at work in Nineveh long before Jonah arrived. And we know this thanks to an archaeological dig roughly 200 years ago. You see, in the early 19th century, archaeological excavations in Babylon, whose, whose ruins, for those interested, are located roughly 50 miles south of Baghdad in Iraq, revealed a series of documents, uh, historiographical texts, mostly carved into stone like the one you see on the screen, that detail events history, leaders, and military campaigns of both the Babylonian and Assyrian empires, right? And, and one of these texts, one of these uh, tablets, known as the Assyrian Chronicles, had a section of recorded history known as the eponym list. And, and this eponym list contains a year-by-year -year list of significant events within the Assyrian empire, and when we get on this eponym list to the Assyrian king, Ashurdan III, who ruled during these particular years, 773 to 755, uh, before the Common Era, the, the very years we're reading about in Jonah, there are mentions of the following events taking place prior to Jonah's arrival. In 765... We read of a severe plague in Assyria. In uh, between 765 and 759, there's a famine in Assyria that is significant. In 763 to 759, there are records of military and political revolts happening in Nineveh all throughout Assyria. But there's one record that's of particular significance because the year lines up almost perfectly with what would have likely been Jonah's trek to Nineveh. On June 15th, in the year 763 BCE, the Assyrian Chronicles record a near-total solar eclipse over Assyria. And this date and event have been substantiated by other recorded history. Now, now the very, these very same records we're talking about indicate what the Assyrians thought eclipses meant, right? With records accompanied by statements such as, the king will die, rain from heaven will flood the land, right? Or there, an eclipse is coming, there will be famine. Or an eclipse is coming, a deity will strike and fire will consume the land. An eclipse is coming, the king will be deposed and killed and a worthless fellow will seize his throne. What does all this mean? It means that the Assyrians believed a solar eclipse to be a sign from God of judgment and impending disaster. And this eclipse in conjunction with the political turmoil, famine in the land, and revolts taking place, would have made the people of Nineveh, as Daniel C. Timmer says, unusually attuned to the message of a visiting prophet. Now, uh, there's been speculation that perhaps the eclipse accompanied Jonah. Right, That he was in the city on June 15, 763, preaching during the darkness. Right? Giving uh, undeniable credibility to his message. 
which I think is absolutely amazing if that were true. And we know from this text already that God can do that. Nature is one of his instruments. But, but regardless of if Jonah visited on June 15th or if he came a little while later, the timing of these events certainly softened the hearts of the Ninevites to the message they heard from Jonah. Right? They were seeing their empire shaken. Their king was likely paranoid about what this eclipse meant for him. And when a prophet from Israel appeared uninvited with words of impending doom that lined up with what they already suspected to be true, you'd better believe that they listened. You see, while Jonah's message was simple, it wasn't a standalone message. God had already been working. The God who has already, in this text, orchestrated a storm and sent a fish had created a climate amongst the people of Nineveh where his word would be received. Right? God had already been working in Nineveh. And church, the same is true for the places we travel with the word of God. Right? We don't know the seeds that God has planted. We don't know what God is already doing in the lives of our coworkers, our friends, or the nations. And while from the outside there's no way that Jonah could have known how fertile the soil in Nineveh was for the word of the Lord, neither can we see just what God has been doing to prepare the hearts of those he has called us to bring his word to. We are called to be obedient and we can trust that there is nowhere we can go where God has not already been working. Right? And the scriptures declare this throughout. Psalm 139 tells us there's, there's nowhere that God is not. Jeremiah 23 reminds us that God fills the heavens and the earth. Joshua, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and more teach that God goes before his people, preparing the way. In Matthew 28, uh, Jesus reminds us that he is with us when we follow into where he has been working. If you've had the privilege of sitting down with a missionary, you've likely heard stories of just uh, how God works to prepare the soil behind the scenes. Right? From, from stories of Muslims dreaming about Jesus and praying for years that a Christian would come and teach them, so that when a missionary eventually does show up, they're begging to learn about Christ. Uh, to stories of people asking God to show them a sign that he was real moments before unsuspecting Christians stumbled onto the scene. Or, or how British missionary Gladys Allward was invited to explain the gospel to hundreds of Tibetan monks she thought would be hostile. Because they had been waiting for a Christian to explain a tract they had received eight years earlier, telling them about a God who loves, and they needed to know more. Right? I, I've heard a number of real-life, first-hand stories like this, maybe you have too, where it became clear that God had already done all the work to prepare the way for people to speak his word. So church, we need to approach our, opportunity to, to our opportunities to share the word of God confident that God has already been working and confident that the word of the Lord will not return void. Knowing that there is no heart God cannot reach, as verse 5 in our text says, from the greatest to the least, God's truth is available to all. Now as we move along, we even read in verse 6 of the king himself in humility sitting in submission to God as a result of Jonah's words and what God had been doing already. Now what an image, right? What an image. Picture that with me. The king of Nineveh taking off his royal robes and sitting down in ash. And when I read this text, I... I and picture this in my mind. I can't get Philippians 10, or Philippians 2, 10 and 11 out of my mind. Right? Here we see the perfect foreshadowing of what will be in the end. When the truth is revealed to all and God is seen in all his glory. That at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And while it is true that not every knee will bow today and next week we'll see that that's not true in this case either, we do know that every knee will bow one day. The only question is if they will bow willingly as servants of him or as defeated rebels, shamefully admitting defeat. Listen to how the Lord says this in Isaiah 45, 22 to 25. He says this, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame, but all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. What a text. But did you notice that? God makes a promise. He says, with all integrity, I say this. He makes a promise. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will swear by me. But the last two verses provide two options, two motivations for bowing. It says, all who have raged against God will bow in shame. And all of his people, the descendants of Israel, will bow in awe and in boasting of who he is. This is a sobering truth that I think we all must wrestle with. How will we play a role in ensuring that the word of the Lord reaches as many hearts as possible so that knees may be bent in submission, in honor, and not in shame? Right, church, we are invited. No, we are commissioned to take part in bringing the one true God to every tribe, tongue, nation, business, neighbor, that they would have the opportunity to experience God, to repent, to bend a knee, and to trust in Jesus. And they'll only have that opportunity if they hear the word of the Lord. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Promise. But how can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them or telling them? And how can anyone tell unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. We're going to end this morning by reflecting on this truth and asking ourselves, how will my friends, my coworkers, my family, Call on the name of the Lord unless someone introduces them to him. How will the city of Winnipeg call on the name of the Lord if we do not share the good news? You see, we've been entrusted with the life-changing message of Christ, not just to keep it to ourselves, We've not been given the way to eternal life simply that we would be blessed by it. No, we've been given the message that we may share it, that the kingdom may grow. In Genesis 12, when God revealed to Abraham and his, that his descendants would be God's very own people, listen to the mission that's attached to the blessing. Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation and will bless you. I think a lot of us stop there. Awesome. Thanks for the blessing, Lord. But he says, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse, who, bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Right? All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
right? God's people are blessed so they can bless. So that God's kingdom, God's blessing would multiply and increase. That God would be known throughout the earth. But this is something that, had, that Jonah had forgotten when he ran away from God. In fact, this was something that all of Israel had forgotten at the time. Israel was not simply a nation to be a nation. They were a nation, a people, so that through them, the world would be saved. And it's the same with the church. You see, God made good on his promise to save the world through a descendant of Abraham when Jesus Christ died for the salvation of all. As 1 John 2, 2 says, Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. But the task of God's people is not simply to receive the truth of a glorious God, but to receive and extend it to all nations from 7th century B.C. Assyria to 21st century Canada. Let's close today by considering the words of Matthew 28, the same words that our Lord Jesus shared as he left the company of his disciples. May this be an encouragement to us. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, the word of the Lord. And don't forget, surely I am with you. I have gone before you to the very end of the age. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that we are not alone. We thank you for the truth that you are working in places we can't even think of right now. But you're also working in places we can think of. You're working in the lives of those people that you have uh, given to us as friends, as coworkers, as neighbors. God, I pray that we would trust that truth, that you are working, and we would trust the truth that your word does not return empty. And may we be people who are bold enough to speak your word, to follow you into the lives of the people that you have put in our way, and that we would point them to your word, point them to relationship with you, that they would bend the knee to Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.